So, good morning. We are glad you're here. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Kim Cameron. I'm in the faculty in the Ross School of Business and a self-identified member of the Center for Positive Organizations. <clears throat> um, and I have had the opportunity this semester to host these pause links sessions once a month. And the theme has been, you won't know this, but the theme has been POS in different kinds of disciplines and its application across um, medicine and anyway, a variety of disciplines. So um, we had scheduled originally a person named Bob Ballerin, who is at McGill University come. Bob got a uh, blood clot, and he's, uh, impo it's impossible for him now to travel as doctor will let him travel. He wrote me a note about that, and <clears throat> we thought, well, doggone it, we can cancel. We can grab one of our own faculty members and sort of do a fill-in. But that very week, three different times, it was really interesting, three different times people said to me, <clears throat> boy, I just came from this presentation or I just saw a, a YouTube video or something on a guy who just knocked my socks off. You have, you, if we can ever get this guy to come give a presentation, you have got to get Vic Strecker to come. Three different times and three different people independently said, holy cow, what a rock star. So I thought, well, maybe at this last minute and with a you know, three weeks or something notice, maybe we can get Vic on his busy schedule to come, and we gave him several dates, and this was the only one that he could fit, but boy, are we lucky to have Vic Strecker. So let me tell you a little bit about Vic, and he'll tell you, I suspect, a little bit of his life, because it's a spectacular story, and it has a lot to do with uh, what he's doing research on right now. So Vic has faculty appointments in the medical school and the School of Public Health, uh, the Cancer Center, uh, the Health and Behavior and Health Education Department, and in Family Medicine. So he can't figure out where he really is, I guess. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but he's done an ex extraordinary job at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> uh, founded the Center for Health Communications Research, and most interestingly and importantly, founded the Health Media in um, Incorporated, a company which was purchased by Johnson & Johnson, and so has had big impact on helping individuals and corporations figure out a way to flourish physically, uh, mentally, emotionally. Uh, Well-being is a big part of what he's been doing, but he'll tell you about a slight change in his research and orientation, which has uh, revolutionized him and lots of other people. Um, He's, uh, uh, he, I'm so grateful that he's here and, and, uh, and, I, and, and ha we have an opportunity to hear him. Before I turn it to Vic, however, let me uh, again acknowledge, and I didn't, Paul Jones, Paul and Diane. <laughs> Paul makes all this possible. Paul is funding the Pause Links um, series and has for several years. I also want to thank and acknowledge Janelle, who... Thank you, Janelle, who organizes all this and makes it great. And uh, to acknowledge uh, University of Connecticut, who keeps the Fab Five's record in place. We're the only freshman who, no, no other Fab Five has ever won the national championship. I was actually rooting for Connecticut to keep our record intact. Anyway, with that, Vic, we're uh, glad to have you here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Kim, thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm going to talk maybe, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, something like that. And I was really hoping we could have a little discussion about this. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Am I OK? Not annoyingly loud or soft? OK, good. Um, I'm an academic. And with that comes the disease of talking too much all the time and getting into too great a detail about so many things. So I thought I might just start out with the conclusion of this talk. <laughs> And the conclusion is pretty simple. The conclusion is to have a purpose in your life. It turns out there's a lot of research that shows that having a purpose in your life is good for you. It's good for the people around you. It may be very good for your organization. 
Um, and now you can go home. That's it. Don't really have anything else to say. Well, I do a little bit. I have something, I have a metaphor that I'd like to talk about. And that is called the boiling frog metaphor. Now, her, who has heard about the boiling frog metaphor? Probably most of you, right? The idea is pretty simple. If you take a live frog and then pop them in this pot of boiling water, the frog is going to jump out right away. That's what happens. But if you put a frog in cool water and just gradually increase the heat, very gradually increase the heat, the frog gets sleepy and he falls asleep and then he boils to death. By the way, is that a true story? Who thinks it is? Anybody? Okay, so you heard that they had done this trial. They had actually, they've written a small book about this in, at Johns Hopkins University in the late 1800s where they had literally dozens of boiling frog experiments trying to boil frogs without having them jump out of the pot. So they tested different amounts of heat, you know, gradually increasing heat. And by the way, if you increase it by tenths of a degree, you can get the frog to go to sleep. Or they also discovered in a separate study there, if you take its brain out. <laughs> nice. So I'm so glad we don't do research like that to test all the urban myths, because I just think it's an awesome urban legend or true. I don't care. What I like about it is that it relates to our public health problems. I'm in the School of Public Health. By the way, is there a little ring to this? Is, should I change that? It's a little annoying, isn't it? Yeah, just slightly. Can I, is that okay? A little better? Yeah, I think that's, can you hear it okay still? Okay. So um, the idea, though, is that this is so relevant to our public health problems that we have right now, our obesity, um, even things like climate change. All of this is so relevant um, because these are all boiling frog problems. We just gradually increase our waistline, right? We gradually become more sedentary. We gradually have this climate, you know, starting to burn up. And we don't notice it. These are public health issues that are really, and, and the biggest public health issues, quite honestly, are behavioral issues. Over 50% of disease and death are related to our lifestyles. Over 50%. We spend $2.8 trillion on health care every year. $2.8 trillion. By the way, we can't afford that. We will not be able to afford it as a, you know, as a country down the road. And not that far down the road, like 10 years, we won't be able to afford $2.8 trillion. But 70% of the $2.8 trillion is related to chronic disease management. So people get chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, all of these issues, asthma. These are long-term chronic illnesses. And it turns out about 70 to 80% of the management of these things are related to our behaviors, our lifestyles. So we dump all this money into acute care, into tertiary health care, which is fine. You know, if I'm sick, I want somebody really taking care of me. But we devote this much into these lifestyle issues. Whether you're sick or you're not sick, the prevention, whether it's primary prevention or even tertiary prevention, keeping these diseases well managed are behavioral issues and they're boiling frog issues because we never notice what's going on. So that's a really big issue and I'd like to talk about that today. What do we do in public health when this happens? Well, we tend to put warning packs on cigarettes. We tend to tell people, you know, if you don't do this, if you don't change, if you don't change your behavior, you're going to die. So typically we love to talk about death. We love to scare people. And when that doesn't work, what do we do? We scare them even more. We try to just up the ante of fear until they go, oh my God, now I get it. I'm going to change my behavior. But you know what? It doesn't work. Why do people smoke? To control stress and anxiety. What are we doing when we induce fear in a person? We cause more stress and anxiety. We have found very often that when we scare a smoker into quitting smoking, they end up smoking more cigarettes. All you have to do is watch a football game or watch a basketball game. You notice yourself eating sometimes? You're eating like this. You're eating mindlessly. It's because of stress and anxiety. That's natural. I watched The Hobbit last night. I ate like, you know, this Costco-sized bag of potato chips. I didn't even notice it. You know, it was a three-hour film, and I'm going, by the time, I was empty. I couldn't believe it. So that happens. Scaring people doesn't seem to work that well. Um, 
And I want to say something, you know, rude, like there are holes in that argument. But you know what? This, is, this actually comes, this actual picture comes from a big billboard. As I was driving down 94 to get to the airport, it was right on the corner of 94 and 275. You might remember this billboard. And I'll never forget this. As I was driving on to the, you know, entryway to 275, I saw this one. Oh, my God. They've got smoke, you know, going out of this guy's trach tube. And I almost got in an accident doing that. I thought, I wonder how many people the Centers for Disease Control has killed because of that poster. So, you know, health risk assessments. We give health risk assessments to, in employer groups. Over 70% of large employers have health risk appraisals or health risk assessments. These ask questions like, do you smoke? Do you drink too much? Do you eat right? Do you wear your bike helmet? Do you wear your seat belts? Blah, blah, blah. All of these standard questions. And then the feedback that you typically get is if you don't quit smoking, you'll die. If you don't eat better, you'll die. These are not health risk assessments. They're death risk assessments. They're really focused much more on death than dying. In fact, the real dependent variable in the algorithms that are used for health risk assessments in health promotion programs for employers, the algorithms always have as the outcome death or mor morbidity, disease. So that focus to me and focusing all the time on this negative thing has been bothersome. To the point, it's really bothered me that we have to pay people to take these things. At our own university, we pay people, what, $100, $150 to take a health risk assessment. Do you know of, I'm in a business school, you should know about this. Do you, do you know of other products that you pay people to take? I know of no other product that you have to pay people to take. There's something perverse about a product we have to pay people to take. If I suddenly gave Kim this water, and I said, Kim, I'll pay you $100 to drink this water. Just take a couple sips even. What would he do? What would you do? T pay you $100, drink this water. What's wrong with this water? <laughs> what are you testing in this water? Are you testing my genes, my DNA? What's wrong? And then after you drink this water, I say, wow, you know, on the basis of this water, I'd like to give you this cup of coffee. Well, what are you going to pay me? You get into this negative vortex of pay, pay, pay. It's odd. Um, I don't understand that at all. And I don't like it. Cause, and what I think, actually, is that we have a bad product. And it's the way we help motivate change in people. And this comes from a medical model. And I have nothing against the medical model. If I'm sick, I really want people to use the medical model to cure me. But if so much of our behavior is related to lifestyle change, or so much of our health outcomes, our cost, our diseases, are related to our lifestyles, how we live our lives, maybe we need to rethink the use of the medical model, which is very much focused on disease and death, and flip that around and think about some other direction we could take. And that's what this talk is really about, how we can do that. So let's get back to the boiling frog. Let's say we are all on the outside of this boiling frog's pot, and we want to get the boiling frog out. What would we say to the, to the frog? We have some signs, whatever we want. Frog, get out. This water is boiling. You are going to die. You're getting sleepy, right? Go away. Jump out. No, you're going to die. That's what we would typically want to say, right? And that's so natural for us to want to say that. If you don't jump out, you will die. What would the frog then say? He would say something like, what do you know? Are you an expert on boiling water? Now go away. I'm getting kind of sleepy. He might also say, you know, there are a lot of other frogs in much hotter water than me. In other words, what are, what are the things he'd say? He might use downward comparison strategies to say, to compare himself to other people who are much worse off in order to defend himself. He might also question the source of the message. Are you an expert on climate change? Are you an expert on smoking? Have you smoked before? Do you know? So he questioned the source of the message. All of this is related to, you know, the kinds of things that real people say when we deliver this kind of public health message to people, you are in boiling water, you have to get out. Why? What's going on? Why do people reject this message rather than consider the message? And I'd say it's fairly straightforward. And the most broad, general answer to this question, I would say that we're very defensive people, that we tend to be defensive. It's almost like we have this castle wall that's around us. 
This castle wall is protecting the self, the true authentic self, what Aristotle called the daemon, D-A-I-M-O-N, the daemon or true self. We have this thing called the ego. This castle wall is often called the ego. The Buddha called it the ego. He said you need to remove the veil from the ego. Psychologists now call this the ego. Eckhart Tolle calls the ego the devil. So philosophers, scientists, for literally centuries have talked about this concept of the ego that protects us from seeing reality. It protects our true self from the outsiders, but it also keeps in and holds our own conceptualization of ourselves. So what are the, some of the things that we can do about this with this kind of defensiveness? By the way, we're all defensive. All of us. I'm certainly defensive. And defensiveness, to some extent, is good for us. If it wasn't, you know, I mean, if we didn't have a castle wall, then every single time we'd walk by someplace and said, buy this, buy that, we'd buy it, right? There's a great book called Yes Man. And he ended up buying everything. And then he ended up in some African country who had asked him for his bank account information, then invited him over. And he said, yes, because he decided for one month he'd say yes to every single thing. He just removed his ego or his castle wall completely. And it got him into tremendous trouble. So we don't want to do that completely. But our walls have gotten thicker and thicker, I think. So what are some of the things that we could do about this? What are some of the issues... Um, or strategies that we could use to get out of this ego wall, this castle wall. And I see three ways. The first way is pretty easy, and it may also not be the most effective, but it's something that we could do a lot more. We tend to live in our castle wall more and more nowadays because of media. In the past, when I grew up, we would all be watching, for example, the news, and we'd watch CBS News, and we'd watch Walter Cronkite on the news in the 1960s. And then when Walter Cronkite in the early 70s went to Vietnam, and he said, man, I don't know if we can win this war. And everybody on the left and right both started going, maybe Walter is right. Well, now we don't have to listen to Walter Cronkite. We, you know, if we're right wing, we can listen to the blaze. If we're left wing, we can go to the hop po. And, you know, everybody can listen to whatever agrees with them totally. We can stay in our castle wall all the time. So one thing we could do is lower this drawbridge that we might have on our castle wall. So, for example, I'm going to guess that all of you, almost all of you, really dislike one of these people. <laughs> Just guessing. And I don't care which one it is, but I'm going to bet if you had dinner with both of them at the same time at a dinner, I'll bet that you'd have a wonderful dinner. Both of these are pretty smart people. The guy on the right wrote a number of books about presidents, pretty bright guy. The woman on the left was a Rhodes Scholar, pretty bright. People don't like one of them, typically. But what if you opened your castle wall and just listened to the person you don't like for half an hour a week. Just for half an hour. Just open that castle wall because you don't have to anymore, do you? You can live with everybody who constantly agrees with you. You know, my wife just listens to Diane Rehm all the time. You know, everything. And I go, you know, she's, she's pretty liberal, you know? And, and she goes, no, she's not. She's very balanced. And, okay, well, listen to somebody else on this side. No, they're stupid. <laughs> I don't think they are. Why are they so angry? Just ask why this other person you don't like is so angry. Just every once in a while expose yourself. I just finished um, Walter Isaacson's autobiography of Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin said an interesting thing. He said, it's your circumstances that lead to your opinions. We may disagree about our opinions, but if I understand the circumstances that led to those opinions, I'm going to better understand your opinions. Not necessarily agree with them, but I'll understand them. So opening this castle wall, I think, is important. Now, there's a second way of doing this, and this is a deeper way, and it may not be a direction that any of us necessarily want to take, and it's called being broken open. So this is Ram Dass. Ram Dass was a psychologist at Harvard. He quit that, and he decided to become a spiritual guru to literally millions of people around the world. He lives in Hawaii. In his early 60s, he suffered a major stroke. This is what he said when he suffered his stroke. He said, my ego is broken open, and now I can see who I really am. In other words, his castle wall broke. 
he could start seeing himself. If you get sick, if you lose your job, if you lose a loved one, if you get divorced, all of those things can lead to becoming broken open and in a way offer an opportunity. I worked in the cancer center here for 15 years and I met literally hundreds of cancer survivors. I never met a cancer survivor, and I'll bet some of you are cancer survivors or certainly know of people who have had cancer or survived cancer. I don't know about you, but I've never met one who didn't change their life in some way. May not have been a long time either that they changed their life, but it was an opportunity, it was an open door of being broken open when you said, you know what, I'm changing something about myself. I'm going to become a vegetarian, I'm going to take up yoga, I'm going to pray, I'm going to stop praying, I'm going to do this or that or that, I'm going to do something to change my life because I see things more clearly. And we usually say to that patient, to that survivor, yeah, that's nice, that's fine. We, don't, we almost don't believe them. We think it's some sort of trauma narrative that they're playing out that's fine, maybe healthy for them, but we kind of, you know, stay away. I don't think that's a good idea for us. I think what's a good idea, personally, is to use that as an opportunity and work with that person to enact what they see more clearly, more vividly in their life. Because now suddenly they're becoming a more authentic person. They've removed this veil that the Buddha talked about. Steve Jobs never thought he would live past 30. That's another great Walter Isaacson biography. Steve Jobs thought that he would um, die before he was 30, and as a result, he built Apple before he was 30. That was kind of nice because he saw his time as being limited. He saw finiteness to the years in his life. In 2005, he gave the commencement address at Stanford. We're probably all aware of that commencement address. But an interesting thing he said is this, that death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. He knew he was dying here of pancreatic cancer. And as he knew he was dying, he said, you know what? I am changing all the time because of this. That's pretty amazing. So knowing he was going to die. It turns out that if you ask college students, which I do all the time now, with, I really bother the crap out of my classes, but I ask, I ask my 180 students, write down what should be on your headstone. Think more about what would be on your headstone. And the first response, ew, no, I don't want to write what's on my headstone. Then I have to think about death. And it turns out in thinking about death, that they end up thinking more about life. It's an econometric, it's Econ 101. If you have, have $10,000 and you're walking down State Street and somebody on the street, a street person says, can I have five bucks? It's easy to give them five bucks, right? If you have $10 and somebody asks for five bucks, it's hard to give them five bucks. In other words, a dollar is not worth a dollar is not worth a dollar. Depends on how many you have in your pool of dollars to begin with. If we think we're going to live forever, then we don't care about life. We don't care about the years anymore. If we know that we're not going to live forever, we start creating a finiteness to our life. Marcus Aurelius, who was probably the best Roman emperor ever, and he is also one of the great Stoic philosophers, wrote this wonderful short book that's about the most modern book I've ever read. It's called Meditations. In his meditations, he said, do not live your life as if you're going to live 10,000 years. Every morning, he would wake up and say, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to die. He actually did. This is a Stoic philosopher exercise. Epictetus did this. Epicurus did this. A lot of philosophers did this um, in the morning. They'd wake up. Seneca did it. Say, I'm going to die. And in doing so, they would live that day much more vividly. And I know that sounds a little like a Hallmark card thing to do, but just think about this. We don't like to think about death that much. And if we did live much longer, and what is the promise of medicine? Now, maybe you can live 200 years. What would we do in those 200 years? Would we just watch more Miley Cyrus twerking videos? I'm serious. Would we watch more reality television? I have a feeling that there's almost a homeostasis over your whole life of saying, I'm going to live this much life. And if you spread the life out, you just live less of that life year per year per year. I'm very disappointed in how we're living our longer lives now, quite honestly. We live longer lives, but do we live bigger lives? Go back to Marcus Aurelius. Go back to Mark Twain. Mark Twain, by the way, said, I don't care about dying. I care a lot about not living. Back then, the life expectancy was in the 40s. 
Mark Twain went around the world a couple of times. He went around the equator. He wrote a book about it. He took a steamship to Hawaii. When people you know, landed in Honolulu, they were horseback people. You know, they were just on horses. He lived a big life. And he didn't care about dying. He cared a lot about not living. That's very different for us. I think with this medical model, we're afraid of dying. We live in these bubbles. We watch a lot of reality TV. Maybe we watch, okay, this is blasphemous. Maybe we watch a little too much sports, too. Maybe we don't, en I know, Kim. Maybe we don't engage in enough sports. But we sure don't live lives quite as big as we could. So I personally was broken up in myself four years ago when my daughter, uh, Julia, passed away. She was a heart transplant recipient. She was one of the first children in the United States, and in fact, in the world, to get a new heart. She caught a virus when she was six months old, just a chicken pox virus, and it attacked her heart. And um, we were told she had only three months to live unless we would list her for a heart. And nobody in the southeast of, Mich of, of the United States had done one. And we were at the University of North Carolina. I was a professor there. And um, so we decided, well, first of all, we had to decide, should we list her at all? And that's a big question for a little baby. You just let her go. And that would make a lot of sense for a lot of people, and it would have made sense for us, too. But then we started asking the question, what would happen? I mean, if she gets a new heart, will she live a life? And then we started asking over the dinner table, the kind of dinner table conversations that you don't have typically, what is a life? What would be a good life? What would be a life considered that we'd consider worth having all of this trouble for, going through the hassle of a heart transplant, the expense, the grief, the worry, the uncertainty? What would it be worth? And we literally did come up with an operational definition of a life. We decided, and this will be different for everybody, but we decided if she could live to be 16 years old and she could love somebody, outside of her family. That's a big life. 16 meaning she could start thinking for herself. She could become social. She could think about her own psychology more. She could have aspirations. So she became one of the first children to get a new heart. And she lived this very big life. She had traveled around the world twice. And one day, it was actually on a spring break four years ago, but it was the same spring break that we just ha had in March. We were in the Caribbean, and we brought her boyfriend with her. And we got them a suite on the beach together. You may be going, really? <laughs> She's 19 years old. She was a freshman here at the university in the nursing school. And uh, she had this amazingly neat boyfriend and said, yeah, sure, we'll get you a suite there. We talked to the boyfriend's mom and dad, and they went, really? And we said, here's our philosophy about it. We don't know how long she'll live. We don't know how long we will live. So why not live every day as if it's your last day? And so the last day that she lived, that night, she turned to her boyfriend on the beach, and she said, I'm so happy that I could die now. And that night, she got a sudden heart attack in her sleep, and she died. Whether she knew she was going to or not, nobody knows. But um, it, it was interesting that, that that happened. And so I was up four months later in northern Michigan, um, right on the beach. And I woke up at 5.15 in the morning after a very vivid dream that I had about Julia, with Julia. And... I decided to, I, I looked outside, and I was, we were right on Lake Michigan, and Lake Michigan usually has crashing waves this big and that sort of thing. Instead, it was like glass, total glass. And I thought I'd hop in my kayak, and I rode way out to watch the sunrise. And as I watched the sunrise, I felt her in me, and I felt that I really needed to move forward. And the words that I felt her saying inside me as the water was shimmering around me and as the sun was coming up, I was in the water about a mile out, was get over it. And it wasn't the kind of get over it, like get over it, Vic. You know, get over it, Dad. You need to get over this. It wasn't about that. It was almost like I needed to get over something. I needed to get over my castle wall. I kind of needed to get over it and transcend my own wall because I was just 
totally absorbed in my own broken down rubble of my castle wall. So I realized, actually, that's the third way to change, to get rid of this castle wall for a while, to see more clearly. And that's if you have a purpose that transcends your wall. If you start getting over it, getting literally getting over your castle wall, your ego, you start thinking more about things beyond yourself, not your own narcissistic self, but something that is more important than yourself, maybe that's a way to become healthy again. So take this woman, for example, who's looking at this cigarette pack warning label. She's a boiling frog, right? So it turns out if we ask this woman to recite her core values, literally recite her core values, just saying, what do you care about the most? We may give her a list or we may ask her just to write down your core values. What do you care about most in your life? And she says something like, I want to be a good mother. I want to be a good spouse. I want to be in control of my life. It turns out that she is far more likely to intend to change her life and to actually change her life far more likely than a control condition just asked to write down current events of the week, for example. This whole concept is called self-affirmation, this whole process. And I started becoming intrigued with self-affirmation after my daughter passed away. I started thinking more because I kind of was losing my own purpose. I was losing my own values. And I realized if I continued on that state that I would die. I didn't know how I would die. I wasn't going to kill myself, but I certainly knew that I was going to end up crawling up into some sort of hole, crawling into some hole and dying in some way, shape, or form. So I started thinking about self-affirmation a little bit more. Here's an example. Let's return to sports, Kim's favorite subject. So this is um, a study that was done in France pretty recently, actually. A group of French researchers uh, went to the United States and had all these data on local dietary fat consumption around the, the sites where they had NFL football teams. So then they went and looked at the NFL football teams and they watched them play and they observed who won and who lost. And as you might guess, if your team, if your football team wins, you eat less saturated fat, 9% less, which by the way is a lot less saturated fat. So your team wins, great, you eat less fat. What happens if your team loses? guess? Probably doesn't take rocket science. Okay. So 16% more. You eat a lot more saturated fat if your team loses. So then they went back to France and studied their own football, right? That's called soccer. I hate soccer. Um, but <laughs> I'm sorry. The offsides rule, I don't get it at all. It's weird. They end up nil-nil and uh, kicks. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry, haven't gotten on my castle wall about that. But here's what they found with soccer. They found exactly the same result, whether you won or lost, when people were not self-affirming. But then they took a whole group of people and they had them affirm their core values. And then they watched this, their soccer game, and here's what happened. They both, after self-affirmation, ended up eating less fat. This is pretty cool. There are so many studies now, literally over 100 studies of self-affirmation where we find less, less racial bias, we find more innovation occurs with self-affirmation, all sorts of things when you recite your core values, what I would call purposeful values, transcending values. Here's another study that I find really interesting. This is done by Jenny Crocker, Jennifer Crocker, here at the University of Michigan. She then moved on to Ohio State. I'm going to transcend and be cool about that for a second. But what she did with 92 college students here, she threatened their ego first. And she did this with one of her doctoral students. This is a really cool study. She first threatened their ego by saying, oh, by the way, you weren't picked for this group by your fellow students. They didn't meet the person, but they read an information sheet that the student had filled out. Or at least they said that, that these, the researchers told this subject after the subject had filled out an information sheet, they, sent, they told the subject, okay, we've sent this information sheet to other students. They decided not to work with you. We hope you don't mind. So in other words, you're hurt. Your ego is threatened, right? It's very much as if you weren't picked for the soccer team. Maybe that's why I don't like soccer. Um, anyway, your ego is threatened when that happens. And we've known for like over a decade, that when your ego is threatened, you smoke more, you drink more, you eat more, you know, all sorts of bad things happen. 
So you're, you kind of lose self-control or what um, Roy Baumeister calls willpower. So we tend to lose that concept of self-control or willpower. And then what she had, what Crocker did, was have people divided into three groups randomly. One group, they had them just write down their core routine of, of the week. What is your daily routine? And then the second group, they had them write down their self-enhancing values. Because she started saying, is a value a value a value? Are all these values that we're asking people to write down, are they all the same? Or are there good values and bad values? That's a great question, isn't it? So this middle group, let's, you know, power, wealth, independence, attractiveness, prestige. These are things that I might call Charlie Sheen values, whatever. You know, there's some kind of value that you go, okay, those are values. It's what some people value. May not be what I value. And they wrote and elaborated about those values. And by the way, every one of the students could do that in that group. It wasn't hard for them to, you know, elaborate on their power values. That was okay. We all probably could do that if asked. But then the third group was asked to write down their self-transcending values and elaborate on those, their empathy values, community values, love values, things like that. And then here's the real study, because all of that was a sham to begin with, that they weren't picked. They were never not picked, but they did have their ego threatened, and then they were randomly assigned to these three groups. They elaborated on their values, and then they said, oh, would you mind being in this second study? This second study is focused on these, chocolate chip cookies. We have all these chocolate chip cookies, and we would like you to taste test them. It's part of another study. Do you mind being part of this study? Oddly enough, 92 out of the 92 students said yes. I will study chocolate chip cookie eating. And they said, yeah, here's a little list of things, the taste and the color and the smell and all that. Write those down. Rate those for me. Have as many cookies as you want. That was key. So the real key and the real outcome variable, the dependent variable in this case, was how many cookies did they eat? And here's what happened. Here's how many cookies they ended up eating. Daily routine, remember, all their egos are threatened. They ate eight cookies if they didn't elaborate on their core values. Eight. They ate five cookies if they elaborated on their Charlie Sheen values, their self-enhancing values. And they ate three cookies, 2.8 cookies, if they talked about their self-transcending values. And each of these are significant from one another. Isn't that interesting? I just find as a person who specializes in behavior change, I can't get this behavior change by scaring a person. I cannot. I can't get a person to change this behavior by telling them how much saturated fat is in each of these cookies. I cannot. I simply cannot explain to a person scaring them or giving them enough information or giving them self-efficacy or, you know, I know you can eat fewer cookies. None of that works the way simply writing down your stupid values relate. Is that amazing? So I was really both shocked at all of these studies that kept coming out and wondering why, what is going on? And it turns out there's more data than that. But we wanted to study what's going on in the brain of this. So we literally started putting people into fMRI, into you know, scanners, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners, and we started looking at the brain itself along with Emily Falk, who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's a great colleague. And these are just preliminary data, but now the data are essentially analyzed, I can say that, and they are getting ready for write-up for publication. So the first thing we did with people was have what's called a self-referential exercise. We had them think more about their self. Remember the, the frog inside? That's the self, right? So we wanted to find out where is the frog? Where is the self located? And by the way, there are over a dozen other studies that have found the same thing. It's in this medial prefrontal cortex. MPFC, medial prefrontal cortex, is related to self-related processing. It's right here. Oddly enough, somebody told me after one of my talks, you know what also that location is? That's where your third eye is. I don't know anything about that. But I thought it was kind of cool. Anyway, this is where the self may be located. Here's what we did then. We gave everybody a message, set of messages saying, you need to work out more. And these are, were sedentary people. So we said, you really need to work out more. And we'd love to give you a pedometer and start working out more and, um, because you need to do this. 
And so then we had half of them, while they were in the scanner, while they were in the scanner, start um, reciting their core values. And the ones who started reciting their core values, that produced more oxygenated blood flow to this part of the brain, and that resulted in greater physical activity. So what we may be finding initially, this is a very early step in looking at neural, Im neural imaging of where this self is, where transcending behavior is. But what we may be finding is that this is exactly where the frog is located. And this is where the boiling frog is. Uh, this is where the hot water is. Now, we are only focused on that front part of the brain uh, and localized there. There are other parts of the brain that are involved in every activity. So the next step will be what happens, what other parts of the brain start getting oxygenated blood flow as we start talking about transcending values with the person. And that's our next step. We'll start looking at that. But this is just early um, in this stage of looking. I also started reading other information about this. I found that having a purpose in life is predictive of cocaine abuse, uh, lack of cocaine abuse relapse after you were in a treatment center six months later. People were 50% less likely to relapse from cocaine abuse and alcohol abuse. People with a purpose in life are less likely to have suicidal ideology and depression. People with a purpose in life are 2.4 times I'll repeat this. People with a high purpose in life are 2.4 times less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease seven years later. These are people in senior centers. This was done at the University of Chicago. Seven years later, 2.4 times less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than people with a low purpose in life. What if you had a drug that did that? It would be a billion dollar drug. Now, I know this is a longitudinal cohort study. They statistically adjusted for everything they possibly could think of initially. Cognitive impairment, other illnesses, depression, a lot of different things. As socioeconomic status, and they still found this 2.4 times difference. However, you really need a randomized trial, don't you? Where half the people actually get some purpose-inducing or values-inducing intervention. We haven't done that yet. But it's amazing that we're finding this so far, and most people don't even know about these data. I mean, if we found a drug doing this, it would be in our drinking water by now. And there, it would be a multi-billion dollar drug. Uh, we know that people with a purpose in life are 30% likely to, less likely to develop heart attacks, and they're less likely to develop stroke. The person who developed that, Eric Kim, is actually in clinical psychology here. He's a doctoral student. And Eric and I are starting to look at other data now using the Adult Health and Retirement Study, a National Health and Retirement Study, where we found that compared to people with a low purpose in life, people with a high purpose in life four years later are 61% less likely to develop sleep problems. These are everybody at initially at baseline had no sleep problems. Four years later, a lot of people had sleep problems, but they're 61% less likely to have sleep problems if they had a high purpose in life. They were 87% less likely to develop obesity. And here's a very important point to our $2.8 trillion budget. They were 67% less likely to use, utilize health care services. That's amazing. So the question, oh, here's one other study that I'll show you about this. Do you know what telomeres are? Telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes. Kind of like, imagine a chromosome being like a shoelace. You know what the ends of our shoelaces, those plastic caps, do you know what those are called? Aglets. Anyone know that? So the plastic caps, those are also, in, in reference to chromosomes, we have these plastic caps at the ends of our chromosomes, but they're called telomeres. The telomeres keep our chromosomes from fraying. And as our chromosomes shorten and get frayed, we get sick and we die. The person who discovered this process was Elizabeth Blackburn. She won the 2009 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine in this area for discovering the process of telomeres and telomerase, which is the enzyme that basically fuels these telomeres. And she had also done a f some studies looking at stress and telomerase and stress and telomeres. She found that people who had a lot of stress in their lives had shorter chromosomes and less telomere activity. So then she hypothesized, if we put people into a meditation program, a mindfulness program for three months, I, she said, I think that we will 
increased telomere activity, telomerase activity, and she found that. So she had, she put people into three months of meditation. She had a weightless control group, which in this case is a really good control group, you know, who are just waiting to meditate, so they're the same kind of people, but for three months they were still on the waiting list. Then she compared telomerase activity, which is the enzyme that repairs your telomeres. She found significantly higher telomerase activity in the meditation group. But here's the kicker in this. It wasn't the meditation. She found that actually there is a, what's called a mediator effect. The meditators were developing greater purpose in their life, and it was the purpose and not the meditation that was predicting telomere activity. That's amazing to me. In other words, having some type of purpose in your life that's transcending, that's bigger than yourself, that's related to your core values, reduces the defensiveness to behavior changes, to lifestyle changes, but in and of itself, it seems to be beneficial to your chromosomes, that it, uh, to your life. It seems to be protective against different diseases. So I thought, why don't we talk about this more? This is amazing, and I decided I better write a book about this. Um, and at first I was gonna write an academic book. And I realized about six people would re read this academic book. And then I thought, uh, you know, maybe I'll write an article, a journal article about this, you know, and kind of a review, putting it all together. Because there's no review article in our field on this, on purpose in life. I thought 12 people will read this, and 10 of them will be reading it so they can cite it for their own journal. Because that's what we do in academia, don't we? We publish, and then we, you know, to get tenure. We publish to get a promotion. Very rarely, every once in a while, I run into a professor who's actually publishing because they love what they're doing. I, that's too mean. There are more people than that. But, you know, I wish there were more. I wish there were more people who are just publishing because they love what they're doing and have questions that are unanswered and need to do that more. Anyway, I realized that that wasn't the route I was going to take. So I decided to write a self-help book. And then after two chapters of the self-help book, I realized that I hate self-help books. Um, Self-help books, to me anyway, tend to be kind of formulaic. I'm a PhD, I'm an MD, I'm whatever, I know more than you, and, uh, you know, here's a bunch of advice, and meet Mary, my patient, you know. It's always some story that you bring in every once in a while after a lot of boring advice. And I just thought, that's not what I want to do either. So I brought in a Hollywood screenwriter friend of mine from Los Angeles, and he said, first of all, this story needs to have your daughter in it. I said, no, I don't want to put my daughter into it. That would be too painful. And he said, no, it should be a trauma narrative. It should be something that, of a journey that you went through yourself in addition to all of this work because you wouldn't be in this work if it weren't for your daughter and your daughter's passing away and also your daughter's tremendously purposeful, meaningful life that she lived. I said, okay, fine. And then he said, well, you're pretty visual when you give talks and things. Maybe you shouldn't write this. And he said, and you're not much of a writer anyway. So maybe you should do this as a graphic novel. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange, but I decided to do that. So I wrote this book called On Purpose, which I'll get to in a second. But this book basically was written with a Marvel DC comic um, illustrator, as you can guess by now, somebody unlike me who can actually draw. But it conveys this entire story. And in this story, my Hollywood screenwriter friend gave me a book by Joseph Campbell about what's called the hero's journey. And the journey, which involves basically going through something very, very difficult and trying to come through that in a more resilient way, being stronger when you come out, said that's the kind of journey that you're on right now, and you should write about that. But every one of these hero's journeys has an oracle, has a sage. This one does. Who's the sage in this? Yoda's the sage. Who's the sage in this? A cricket, a little bug. And so I started thinking about this oracle and thinking, wow, what should I do? Should I, what kind of oracle could I get? And it could be like some disgusting little creature if I wanted. So I was in the British Museum in London, and I started thinking about this. I, you know, I was thinking all along. And this is my favorite place to be in the whole world, practically, the British Museum in London, where they have this enormous Egyptian uh, section, and it's, it's enormous. They have more Egyptian artifacts there than Egypt seems to, and it's because they stole all of them from Egypt in the 17 and 1800s and brought them up to London, and so they have all these things, and this is a cartouche right in the main floor of the Egyptian 
um, section of the British Museum. And I saw this cartouche here that had this beetle, a scarab, and it had this sun, and it had what looked like a castle wall. And I thought, oh my god, that's really intriguing. So I started looking into this scarab more, and I realized that the scarab, I learned that the scarab's name is Kepri. And the scarab is the number one god in ancient Egypt. And Kepri was this god who would push the sun up every morning. And I started thinking, wow, where is he pushing it from? And, you know, I was thinking about my own chaotic events that had occurred in my life. I think about other people's chaotic events. You know, he pushes it out of the darkness. And you know what the Egyptians called the darkness? Chaos. So this scarab god, Kepri, would push the sun up every morning out of chaos. And I thought, wow, that is so relevant to the kinds of things I'm doing. This, this is an actual hieroglyph, a comic of an actual hieroglyph where, where Kepri is pushing the sun up every morning. And I thought it's so relevant to my own experience that I was having. So I started learning about what the scarab was. Like, it just, you know, where did the scarab come from? Why did they come up with this thing? And I learned that the scarab god actually was modeled after the dung beetle. Now imagine this. Imagine ancient Egyptians. Just put yourself in the role of an ancient Egyptian. And they're looking at this little bug, pushing this giant ball of shit forward, and you know, just going, I think that'll be our number one god. <laughs> I mean, what's going on? Why? Why did they do that? Well, for one thing, I think they saw that this little bug would push this little ball of dung in this totally, perfectly straight line, come hell or high water. No matter what happened, they'd push this ball forward. If you put imp you know, impediments in front of it, it'd still push this ball forward. And what's interesting is, first of all, the family name of the dung beetle is Scarabidae. So it really was the scarab. And this particular one is Sisyphus. The genus name of this particular dung beetle is Sisyphus. Now you know about Sisyphus, right? The guy, the god who pushed the boulder up the mountain every day, only to have it come down every day, every night. And everybody thought, oh my god, this is the worst thing that could happen. Sisyphus must have, you know, he had to do this for, for eternity. This is the biggest curse ever. And then Albert Camus, who was an existentialist philosopher from France, from Paris, um, what, what did existentialist philosophers focus on? Purpose in life. That was the number one thing they focused on. He wrote this book called The Myth of Sisyphus. And in this Myth of Sisyphus, the last two lines, he says this, the struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. The existentialist argument, whether you're religious, like Soren Kierkegaard, or you're an atheist, like Camus, like um, Sartre, like a lot of these existentialist philosophers, they said it's important to have a purpose in your life. Whether there's real meaning in life almost doesn't matter. Whether it's a ball of dung, it doesn't matter. What's important is that you have a purpose in life. So I started thinking about this concept of the dung beetle. And this dung beetle is amazing. First of all, their food falls from heaven. That's kind of nice. You know, you're just walking, you're a dung beetle, you're walking along, and suddenly, plop, right in front of you, out of the blue, you have no idea where it came from, is all of your food source. That's pretty incredible. So they're pretty happy, I think, overall. And then they build this great big ball, and they build this beautiful spherical ball, and they do a headstand on the top of the ball, and they release a pheromone. I, I talked to the number one dung beetle expert in the world from the University of Western Australia about this at great length, and he said, these are amazing bugs. They, they do this headstand, they release a pheromone, and then all these female dung beetles come in, and they go, wow, nice ball. <laughs> what they're saying is that they're looking at the sphericity of the ball. Because the ball has to be spherical so they can roll it easily. The other thing the female says is, wow, you are pretty horny. Yeah. And the reason they're saying that is that they literally are looking at the size of the horn coming out off of the dung beetle. Why? Because the dung beetles, as they're rolling their ball, have to defend it. So here's a male dung beetle. Here's another male dung beetle. Oh, nice ball. Go away. Just snatch and grab. Immediately just grab the dung ball. So a, a male and female dung beetle 
protect the ball, and they do that with their horns. So they look at the horniness and they look at the, the sphericity of the ball um, before they decide whether they're going to mate together. And then they go ahead and mate, and that becomes their purpose in their life. Dung beetles also, interestingly enough, follow the Milky Way to make their decisions about where to navigate. That is the only, the dung beetle is the only bug, the only insect known to man who uses the stars to navigate. I just, I was stunned by this. This just came out very recently um, out of some research in, uh, in South Africa. So the other thing that I like about this is that this stuff happens to everybody. You know, we are either born into dung or this happens to us, problems happen to us. And it had a lot to do with resilience. And when this happens to us and we're a dung beetle, and suddenly we create dung balls and we create a purpose out of it. And I thought, wow, I have got my sage. I've got my oracle. His name is Winston and he's a dung beetle. And Winston and I, by the way, um, teach the class in my book. And Winston gets smarter and smarter and he becomes the real sage, the real Yoda in the book itself. He teaches the philosophy. He teaches the science. Together we literally do have a Huffington Post blog together, and uh, Ariana Huffington had read an early draft of my book and said, Vic, you should really put this into a HuffPo blog. And I said, well, that's great. You know, I'd like to have a partner if I could. And said, oh, good. What kind of partner? Another professor? Not really. Um, so convincing her that I was going to have a dung beetle for a partner in this took a little convincing, but she was open-minded enough and said, yeah, actually, that's a cool idea. So Winston and I now have a regular HuffPo blog. We were just in the Wall Street Journal last Monday, um, and so this is starting to come out into the press. And I like the idea of having this kind of sidekick who is a goofy character who also literally does, is probably the lowliest character you could imagine. Because part of the message here is that this is not just for people at the top of the pyramid. This is for people at the bottom of the pyramid as well. I think having a purpose in life is very important. So to start summarizing here, rather than focusing all of our attention on disease and death and, you know, saying if you don't quit smoking, if you don't eat better, et cetera, you are going to get sick and you're going to die. What if you try to switch the the direction of this. And this is, of course, what this whole, con this whole colloquia colloquium is about, positive psychology, positive organization. So rather than thinking about negative, how about thinking about positive? But what would be the op opposite of death? Well, I guess it would be life, right? And what's clo most closely related to really living a life, it would be having a purpose in your life. How do you develop a purpose? Well, the argument, rather than saying, if I don't change, I'm going to die, if I do change my life, I'll have more vitality and energy to achieve my purpose. I would argue that that's a far more motivating um, message to make. But it has to be anchored around purpose. So I started looking at this, and I started asking, this, this requires a very different set of research then. So rather than research that's always focused on disease and death, where the outcome variable like in the Framingham Heart Study or Alameda Study or North Karelia, all these big human population laboratories we use in public health, where the outcome variable is death or disease, I needed to find studies that looked at energy and vitality as an outcome. And it turns out there are a bunch of them. Energy and vitality is, part of, is an outcome variable where there's a lot of, there are a lot of studies where there are randomized trials, and you can see what predicts more vitality. And I found five things that predict vitality really well and consistently. The first one is sleep. Sleep is amazingly predictive of more energy and vitality. Next one is presence or mindfulness. Now, one could call this mindful. Eckhart Tolle doesn't like to use the word mindful because he says, when you're mindful, your mind should not be full. It should be empty. So he likes to call it presence, so I called it presence. Just being here and now, not thinking about the past, not thinking about the future, being totally present. The third thing is activity. We know that physical activity is really predictive of greater vitality, and that makes perfect sense. Oddly enough, at the end of the day, when I'm super tired, the last thing I feel like doing is working out, but when I do work out, I actually get more energy, oddly enough. That's a strange thing, but actually working out gives you more energy, not less energy. And then the next one is interesting, creativity. 
In Sweden, and only in Sweden, they've done these studies where half the subjects, a whole bunch of subjects, they'll give uh, tickets to jazz concerts, to operas. They'll give them drawing lessons, painting lessons for two years. And this other group, they just let them go on as a usual care group. They find that the group they've just encouraged creativity in ends up two years later with far greater vitality and energy. So I thought, wow, creativity is so interesting. When we're creative, you, I'm sure you know that you feel more energetic in your life. And finally, eating well. We know that a glycemic load control diet or a Mediterranean diet both relate to greater vitality. So both of those are important. In other words, if you give yourself more space, you end up with greater energy or vitality. Then there's this concept of energy toward your purpose. We all, a lot of us have a lot of energy in our lives, but if we don't have a purpose, where are we going? Seneca literally said, when a man does not know what harbor he's making for, no wind is the right wind. So it doesn't matter how much wind is in your sails if you don't know where your purpose is, right? So I thought that was important. And then finally, this concept of aligning your purpose with your life. How do I do that? This is what Aristotle called eudaimonic happiness or eudaimonic health. Eudaimonia, he said, the daemon, again, is the true self, and eudaimonia is living in accordance with your true self. So how do you live your life in accordance with your true self? And what, is, what does that even mean? What does that alignment mean? I'd argue that that is the truest definition of health that we could come up with. This alignment between how you live your life every day and your purpose in life. Very much as if this tree were your life and the root system was your purpose in your life. How do you live that? So we also know that living a life with purpose at one's work contributes to all of these outcomes. Greater engagement, motivation, more satisfaction, less absenteeism. There's great data on this and consistent data that shows that when you are living in a, when you're working in an environment that's purposeful, you have these activities. So I'll give you a couple of examples, and these are real examples of people that are also in my book. My purpose is to help the poor, the sick, the dying, and to help ignite in them a spiritual awareness to serve the Lord. What does she do for more energy? She moves, she prays, she's more engaged, she's learned to cook, and she snacks during the day. Here's another one. My purpose is to create a new business that helps people change their behaviors through finding purpose in their lives. Any entrepreneurs out there, this would be a great business to start up. And what does this guy do? He does yoga, he rests, he bikes to work, he's learning to draw cartoons, awesome, and he eats smaller meals. How about her? She's a biologist. My purpose is to study and better understand nature and give this knowledge to others to be more engaged with my partner. What does she do? More water during the day, less water before bed, so she doesn't wake up and pee at night all the time, and then she has a harder time sleeping. Makes sense? She meditates now. She kickboxes, she does tango, and she's cut down on junk food. This person, this is a custodian at an elementary school. I'm giving the children in my school a clean building, and I'm serving God. That is interesting, isn't it? If you had 10 of these people and you had 10 other custodians just working because it's a job, who would have the lower absenteeism rate? I mean, I think that's pretty clear. And Jane Dutton and Bob Quinn and other people have done some of the pioneering work in this area, and they've called it job crafting, to take an existing job expectation and expand it to suit their desire to make a difference in the world. You can do that. We've done that at Health Media. We, we, I, I do it in a lot of different places, and Jane and I are talking more about how an individual's purpose could be linked to an organizational purpose, and if anybody's interested in that and knows a lot about it, I'd love to talk to you because I think that's a tricky connection. That's a tricky tango to do, and I think it'd be really exciting to learn how to build that up a little bit more. So I'm going to close with this introduction now of my talk, and that's to find your own purpose in your life. So I've written this book called On Purpose, just just published, and I have a website with this, and in the website there's an app, and the app is, it, it starts by collecting information about your core values. Remember self-affirmation, the idea of thinking more about your core values, what's important to you. So you get to identify those core values, and then you get to take the core values 
and literally pull them down with your cursor, move them uh, with your mouse, and pull them down according to how deeply held each of those values are. That allows us to rank order those values. Of course, we collect these data. We anonymize it completely because we don't you know, want to know who you are, but we do want to have these data. And then we help you develop a purpose in your life. So you create that purpose. You can also, by the way, meet the Grim Reaper if you want. And the Grim Reaper asks you, what would you like on your headstone? And you don't have to do that because some people go, ew, I don't want that. And other people go, awesome, yeah. And so we have some amazing headstone experiences. Uh, and then what happens is every single day, once all those data are set, you've kind of set, establish your purpose, which you can change anytime you want. You can change your values. But every day what you do is align how you lived your life in the last 24 hours with your purpose and then put in, indicate how well you slept, how present you were, how active you were, how creative you were, and how well you ate. And then over time, we can help, just like a health risk assessment, establish which of these are most important to your alignment, or what I would consider your true health. Now, by the way, I have brand new data that I just analyzed literally this morning from this, from um, over 700 people who have taken this. Now over 1,500 people have taken this, but I was sent a data set last month, and I just started looking at it. And here are the things that are most related to your alignment between your daily living, remember the tree, and your purpose, your root system. So you see, and these are just beta coefficients, what that means is I put all of this into a regression model and I was just looking at all five of them statistically adjusting for each of the other variables. And what you see is that, it is a surprise to me, frankly. Presence and creativity are the biggest predictors of your alignment on average. That is really interesting to me. I would have expected sleep. I would have expected eating or activity, but not presence and creativity. And that's kind of awesome. For me personally, after 10 days, the app tells you what is most related to your own alignment. And it said, Vic, creativity is most related to your own alignment. That, that was interesting too. So this is just the very earliest analysis of this. Here's another little thing that I analyzed, and, and I know this is hard to interpret, but I'll show you really quickly what this means. So alignment is on this y-axis, so five is total alignment, and this is your group age, and this is how well you ate from one, which is crappy eating, all the way to five, which is great eating. Look what happens with age. It's not that big a predictor until you get older. Then suddenly eating is incredibly predictive of alignment. See, suddenly, where older people, if they're not eating well, they really are misaligned between how they live their life and their purpose in their life. This is just an example of the kind of data I'm finding, I'm finding all sorts of interesting interactions. Here's another interaction I found interesting. I've done a factor analysis of all of these values, and I won't go into any detail, but one of the factors was the distinction between being responsible and being creative. It turned out that the people who said responsibility is really important were far, I, I mean, that, that was the opposite for them. They're very unlikely then to report creativity. And the people who said creativity were very unlikely to say responsible. So that creates this dichotomy, almost like a dumbbell. Am I really responsible or am I more creative? And there are people in between, of course. But looking at that, what we found was that if you are very responsible, Let's see, yeah, responsible would be here in this blue line. It turns out that being more present didn't do anything for you. But if you were creative, in the red line, being, being present was super important for you. So imagine an app then, after this version one, we create a version two that starts saying, you know what, we could help you based on who you are, based on your value constructs, based on your typology, based on your age and your gender, we could start helping you maximize your alignment over time. We could also look at lagged effects. So if you sleep well now, sleep is a great one for this because we usually don't notice uh, the beneficial effects of good sleeping or good eating or mindfulness, maybe for another day or two, maybe for a week. And we could start identifying those lagged effects. So you could see what this kind of very, very simple tool that literally takes 20 seconds a day to operate, um, what it could produce over time. So 
you know, somebody sent me this uh, cartoon recently saying, you need to find a purpose in your life. Well, I've tried it, but it's not coming up on my iPhone at all. Well, now it is. You have no excuse. It is on your iPhone. You can go to iTunes, and you can pick this up. And all of this, by the way, is for free. So this is a not-for-profit effort that I'm engaged in. I really want as many people to use this for free as possible. I just want to be able to look at your data and start finding out, is this really a good variable? Are there other good variables to study? Could we create a dashboard for people so they could really study their lives? Could we connect this with devices such as a Nike fuel bank? Could we connect it with your DNA if you want that? Could we, you know, what could we start integrating this with so that you become a better, more transcendent, purposeful person? That's how you live your life. That is not narcissism. Part of quantified self-movement is very narcissistic, but I'd say this is all aimed at not being a narcissist. It's kind of the opposite. So to close up, I am a boiling frog myself. I have all sorts of issues still, lots of you know, things that I'm dealing with every day. But with my purpose that I have in my life that's really been inspired by my own daughter, I feel like I can continue in my life. I can continue trying, hopefully, to make a difference in this world. And um, I hope that all of you, as part of this talk, have thought more about your own purpose in life. My purpose is to help other people develop a purpose in their life, and it's also to teach every one of my students as if they were my own daughter. So whenever a student needs to set up a time with me and I'm going, God, I don't have any time this week, I think, what would I want my daughter to have from that faculty member. And so I say, okay, I'll try to find time. It could be over the weekend. It could be in the evening, whenever. I'm not perfect at that, but I do my very best. And we all know as faculty members how difficult that can be to try to regard every one of their students as if they were close to them. And that is part of my purpose. Um, this is another person's purpose, uh, to fight for a more just world. Um, I want to say one other thing about my own purpose. Uh, in the beginning of this year, I decided to, um, before I could have an alcoholic beverage, that I needed to meditate. So every day now, I've been meditating since the beginning of the year. It's awesome. Now, I, I messed up one time when I meditated and then forgot to drink. But um, it's, this has worked so well for me. Um, and when I look at other people's purposes, I find it very inspiring, too. So I'll just show you a few. In the 16th century, um, Basho, a poet from Japan, wrote this, what's called the frog haiku. Into the ancient pond, a frog jumps, water sound. I would say that we're all frogs. We're all frogs in boiling water. And I'd suggest that we can all jump out of that boiling water. And I think if we all did jump out, we would be changing the world. Thank you.